everyone to the 2019 Graham Clark Creation Special Showcase to schools. Um, we have a really exciting opportunity for all of you today to hear from our 2019 Graham Clark Curator, Professor Timothy Dennison. He is the Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies. Um, Professor Dennison holds a joint appointment in Engineering Science and Clinical Neuroscience at Oxford, where he explores the fundamentals of physiologic closed-loop systems in collaboration with the MRC Brain Networks Dynamics Unit. Um, I'm sure I probably just said a lot of things that didn't make much sense. I'm going to leave it to, to um, Professor Dennison to let you know a bit more about what he works on. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity at the end to open the floor for lots of questions, so uh, make sure to pay close attention and think up lots of wonderful questions. Um, enjoy and welcome Tim. Thank you for the introduction. This session is meant to be a bit informal, and so I was going to start out with a high-level overview of some of the ideas that we're pursuing in our lab, as well as actually getting there, some of the journeys, so that you can get a feeling for my background and maybe seed some questions that you might have about what it's like to work in science and industry, um, as well as in academia. So to get started, I want to talk a little bit about dynamics, and so I need a volunteer. So who's willing to volunteer for me? I need a volunteer. All right. So corner there, hand up on making it easy on the aisle. Yes, please come down and join me here. <laughs> Give them applause for our volunteer. All right. What's your name? What is Pat? Good to meet you, Pat. I'm Tim. So what I'd like for you to do is to balance this stick on the end of your hand. Nice and flat on the palm of your hand. Let's see how well you can do. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, nice, 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 nice. All right, Pat, good job. All right, well done. Give you a round of applause. Now I want to plant a seed that kind of the wavering and the wobbling is actually a sense of what a lot of patients suffer who have movement disorders. And so the course of this talk, I'm going to eventually get to what we're doing to try to help people who in their activities of daily living actually suffer from movement disorders. And so it's not just balancing on a stick, it's actually things like simply trying to feed yourself or pour yourself a glass of water. So to get started, I want to make sure everyone understands who Graham Clark is and the importance of the invention that he brought about. So how many people are familiar with the cochlear implant? Excellent, excellent. And so the basis for the cochlear implant is actually shown here on the left. You can see the cross-section of the basilar membrane. And this is actually what brought me into science, uh, especially bio biology. Because inside of that little membrane are these hair cells. And so shown over on the left, you can see the base of the cell, kind of the thing that looks like a uh, a squash or a large cucumber, but at the top there are those little hair cell filaments. And what actually happens is, is the membranes, come, as you hear me speak, there's a membrane that's bouncing up and down like a drum. These cells are attached and actually move as that drum goes back and forth, the tips of those hair cells move back and forth. And a professor at the University of Chicago asked me to come and help in his lab and do electrophysical measurements of these hair cells. And it was really interesting for me. So I was about 19 at the time, and this exposed me to the intersection of physics, engineering, and biology. And then eventually, how we can replace those cells when they're damaged with an electronic circuit, which is shown on the right. And so it's really interesting in terms of the cochlear implant that they could go in and understand the biology, how it functions, how it goes wrong, and then replace that biological function with an electronic circuit. This is a quite a powerful technique, and there's almost a million people who have been implanted with a cochlear implant. And so it's really a, a, just an absolutely astounding number. Now, what got me started in doing measurements in science was actually physics. So at this time, I was a physics, physics undergrad, and I was working in a laboratory measuring cosmic rays. 
So one of the big mysteries of the universe is where do the sources of these cosmic rays come from? So it's really unknown. You get these massive bursts of energy that come from space, but we're trying to pinpoint the origin. And so what we were building, and I was working at this time for a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Jim Cronin, but I was a lab tech, it was a large grid on the desert floor in Utah. So outside of Salt Lake City, out in the barren desert was this large grid. Now the idea was, you can think about it, there's a detector here at each of these points. As cosmic rays would come in from outer space, they would actually start to collide with particles in the atmosphere and create basically a shower coming down. So from the upper right there, a particle comes down, starts to decay, cause other collisions, and it would create basically this spread of radiation, of, ra of high energy particles that would spread across the desert. And so what you could do, you can imagine, is you measure the timing of these hits. Suppose, let's do a little quiz, it's coming from this direction down to Earth, following here. Will the time that it hits this point be before or after it hits this point? So it comes in like a wave of particles from space, and it hits this detector, and then it'll hit this detector, and then it'll hit this detector. And what we would do is measure all of the particle events across this large array, and based on the timing, work backwards and say this is where the origin was in space. So it's absolutely fascinating. But one of the fun things about science is sometimes it just requires a lot of hard work. So my job, getting started, was not the glamorous job of building electronics and the like. My job was to lay the sheets of lead on top of every one of these detectors. So it's about, you know, think about 40 plus degrees Celsius in the sun carrying large sheets of lead, putting down the shield. Now, fun part about it was when we were putting down the lead, we got a call from Chicago saying, what are you guys doing out in the desert? All the detectors are going wrong. And it ends up that the lead, being black, was absorbing the heat from the sun and overloading all the electronics. And so my next job was to go around all these detectors with a can of white paint and paint them white. But part of this message is a lot of science takes a lot of hard work and a lot of determination and teamwork. So for this, I eventually ended up um, with my interest in biology going to MIT and starting to study electronics and um, control engineering. And at the time, this is back in the mid-90s, mid-1990s, we were just on the verge of sequencing the first genome. So that was still a novelty. There was a massive undertaking across the globe to sequence the human genome and complete it. Now the thing is, that took an enormous amount of effort, an enormous amount of time and cost. And so we were looking for new ways in the academic community to efficiently measure genes, and see if we could actually do it in a much less expensive manner. So let's go ahead and roll the tape. And so this ended up being licensed um, by a company, uh, ironically, in Oxford, called Oxford Nanopore. But what we were pursuing was putting ion channels into a membrane, and then reading DNA as it went through that channel. And as the ions flow around the DNA, we could actually measure discrete fluctuations in the current through the channel and use that to read out like the DNA like a ticker tape, kind of going through a single strand of DNA at a time. And so one of the big challenges when I was working on the project was coming up with enough signal to noise ratio that we could actually detect these single strands and try to elucidate what the actual base pairs were. So another message from this story is that I did a first prototype of this and patented it as part of my PhD thesis, but this was back in the late 90s, 2000s. And just now, close to 2020, it's become a commercially viable process. And so you can actually buy the little, they call it the Minion now, a, a nanopore sequencer that plugs into the side of your laptop computer and allows you to read DNA. Now it's not as, say, efficient or accurate, I should say, not as accurate as a large machine, but by basically having it local, they're able to go into new areas like emerging markets and countries and do some rapid sequencing. And so this is an idea of how you can then expand your technology and your experiences into new domains. 
So after this, I had to find a job, and I chose to go into industry. And my reasoning for going into industry was that I wanted to make products and try to work on solutions for people um, out in the general population. So who's familiar with airbags? Anyone ever have an airbag go off in your car? Okay, a few people. So the, the first role I had out of uh, MIT was to work at a company called Analog Devices. And what we were working on were these little miniature machines that would measure acceleration. And so the idea is a mass is suspended on a substrate and th attached through springs. And you can think about it as the acceleration, so you're moving down the screen and you stop suddenly, that center movable plate continues to go down and push against the spring. And then with capacitors, we could read out the deflection. And my job was to actually build those circuits and read out the deflection. Now what's interesting is on the right is a picture of an actual MIMS accelerometer um, in practice. And what I want you to note is that each of those wire bonds that go from the chip out to the package is about the size of a human hair. And so we're actually literally designing miniature machines on silicon and on the order of microns, def measuring the deflections that on the order of a hydrogen atom occur when a car undergoes a crash. And then the job of this chip was to go to the central computer and tell the airbag when it was time to fire and tell it also when it was not time to fire, which is, of course, most of the time. Now, what was exciting about this job is that right at this, right at this moment, two-axis accelerometers and low-G accelerometers were becoming um, viable out of this laboratory, and so you started to see them in cell phones. And so how many of you are used to uh, your cell phone and you turn, the location, you turn the orientation and it changes from landscape to portrait, and you're used to that automatically? Yeah, that was actually enabled with technology like this. And believe it or not, when I was your age, that did not exist, nor did a cell phone. So this is one of those things that's very interesting to watch the um, evolution of technology over time. So after working in analog devices for about five years, I came back and started to focus on um, electrical engineering with a biological focus. And so if we can roll this tape. This is my first job out of Medtronic, where I worked on cardiac um, pacemakers. And so the notion of a cardiac pacemaker is that you have a slowly beating heart. It's not beating fast enough for you to uh, actually stay conscious in many cases. And so leads are implanted in the venous system and routed down to your right ventricle and then attached to an implantable pulse generator. Now what this pulse generator does is create charges of energy that go down and basically speed up the heart, if you will. And inside of the device are little accelerometers that also help to adjust the rate based on how active you are. So recently, there's been innovations where this pacemaker has actually shrunk down to the size of a vitamin pill. And so it has all the functionality of a traditional pacemaker in terms of sensing and pacing capability, but now the size is so small that it can be implanted in new ways. So historically what you had was a scar and a slight bulge on your chest, but now with the system being as small as it is, you can go in through the upper leg, route the device up through the venous system, and then plant it, implant it just like you would a cardiac stent. That's kind of what's shown here. So in you go. Retract the system. Through little hooks, it stays in the heart, and then you can come in with a wireless programmer and adjust the characteristics of the pacemaker. And so the fun part of this was working on really cutting edge electronics, low power electronics at that interface. So we'd measure the heart and other physiological signals. And what's really gratifying, the best part of this job, is that at this moment there are about one million hearts that are beating, that are relying on technology that I had a part in designing. And so that's kind of the best part about working in these uh, positions in industry is the impact that you can have on people's lives. So now we're going to start to come back and think about that demo with Pat and balancing the stick. And so this is going to be a video that shows a patient who has essential tremor. So let's go ahead and start the video. And what you're going to notice in this gentleman is 
when he tries to actually move and control his motion, he has instability. So he has the inability to actually control his motion and he'll end up spilling quite a bit of water from this cup. So on his arm, there's accelerometers and gyros that help the scientist to quantify things, but the key point for you is to see just how difficult it is for him to pour water. So this makes it quite challenging for him to control his activities of daily living. And so feeding himself, taking care of himself is a real challenge. And so what I'm gonna talk about tonight at the oration is this notion about building a brain coprocessor. So just like you have circuits in your computers or in your wireless smartphones that are running computations, what we're working on in the field of neural engineering are circuits that can interface with the nervous system and basically form a closed loop, a way that actually supplements how the brain is acting and when it's acting up, take measures to control it and try to restore more normative behavior. So there's all kinds of blocks that are important. So you know, down at the bottom, you can see a brain that represents the patient. And we have to think carefully about the signals that we're gonna detect, how we actually extract meaningful information from it, how do we recognize patterns, and then adjust control signals that go back and stimulate the body. And so as an, for an analogy of this, you can think about a furnace in your home where you have a furnace that's providing heat and raising the temperature in the room, and then you have a temperature sensor that measures how hot or cold it is, and then a control loop that makes the appropriate adjustments to the furnace. That's basically the intuition that you need to have for the kind of systems we're building. So for the teachers in the room, it was an example like this that actually changed the course of my life. And I think this is my point to you for the students, is looking for these moments. So this is, on the right, is a inverted pendulum. And so the mass is this represented by this stick, and we'll talk a little bit about this wheel. In physics, when you're studying physics, you oftentimes study the inverted pendulum and you'll measure, find all kinds of mathematical equations that show it's unstable. So once you start to tip over, over you go. I, I always think about this as an analogy for the patients that we're trying to help. And so once they're trying to tip over, it's really hard for them to come back on center. But the key point is if you apply engineering principles, you can have sensors that measure the amount of tilt, and then you can take a corrective action towards it. In a way, you're changing the laws of motion for the stick, and ultimately, we think about ways to change motion for the patient. So, because I had to fly in from the UK, I brought my little robot, so I apologize. But this is actually the equivalent of the stick, and here are the wheels. I'm gonna give you the first demo, where you see it's unstable. Okay, tips and falls over just like when Pat was holding the stick. If he didn't compensate, over it goes. But now what I'm gonna do is turn on the wheels. And you can see that the robot will stabilize and hold itself in a proper position. You can see there, now it's rolling around. But it compensates, and what's interesting is, as it gets perturbations, it actually adapts to those perturbations. So suppose your patient's going through their activities of daily living and they change their medication. Give it a little kick. It recovers. Now one of the things is on this simple little robot is that there's a stable point where it will keep rolling around. But I think you get the point that by adding sensors and closing a loop, we're able to actually stabilize a system that would otherwise be unstable. Does everyone get the point? Because it's really important. And the key message that I want to have you have as students, and what changed the life for me, is that in reality, when you study the science, and you study the engineering, and you start to apply it, you can actually start to manipulate and adjust the laws of physics from a certain point of view. You can start to bend them a little bit towards your dreams and what you'd like them to achieve and have a positive impact on society. So let's come back and roll this tape now.
So now that you have the intuition for a closed loop system, we're gonna revisit this patient, the gentleman who has trouble controlling his tremor. So I'm gonna start over again and just get everyone reoriented with his uh, initial challenge. You see he's having issues pouring his glass. And now it gets interesting. So working with the team at the University of Florida, we designed a brain implant. And what it does is actually measure a signal off the top of his head, and that's the raw channel at the top, and it extracts when he's thinking about moving. When he's thinking about moving, the bottom trace in purple, we adjust the stimulation. And so you can see the video is synchronized with the red, so here he starts to think about moving, we ramp the stimulator up and his tremor goes away. When he puts his hand down, the stimulation is lowered. And so what you can think about is from these engineering principles of a sensor and a control loop and stimulation, we've basically constructed for this gentleman a new brain prosthesis. So it's a new network in the brain connecting his motor cortex and his thalamus, and by engineering this network appropriately in collaboration with neurologists, neurosurgeons, and clinical researchers, we're able to basically functionally address his residual tremor. Just like in the example that Pat had of this stick as being conditionally unstable, by applying a closed loop system, we're able to stabilize it. So my key message that I really want to close out with all of you and start to take away is that you have power as students through engineering and science to kind of push out new, new creations and new ways of doing things. So after about 20 years in industry building these kind of products, I have taken a new position at Oxford, and it's really that goal of training the next generation and doing some advanced research in these areas. And so at Oxford, I'm working in the Department of Engineering Science and collaborating with the clinicians on what might be coming next, what is gonna be beyond this brain-computer interface, and how might we um, impact even more diseases. So I am gonna open it up for some Q&A, because I'm more interested in answering your questions. But what I really want you to take away from today, more than anything, is this notion of the power you have to be creative and to change the world. So as Cardinal Sanson said, others dream of things that were and ask why. Why is this pendulum unstable? But you can dream of things that never were and ask why not, and think about what you can do to actually stabilize it and take action in the world. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. I'd like to thank team, um, Tim on behalf of everyone on um, what was a really entertaining, interactive, and really interesting presentation. Um, so we will have opportunities for all of you to answer questions. So I don't need a microphone, so I'm going to get you to stand up and just speak quite loudly. So, um, so I guess this is kind of specific to your field. But how do you address concerns, however unfounded they may be, around um, implants and um, other kinds of bioaugmentation? Oh, so it's a great, it's actually a great question. In fact, the, the question will come in two pieces, um, especially because of the, the word you used at the end, augmentation. So a lot of the work that we do is, especially in the research, is performed under the review of an ethical board. And so suppose we wanna try something, a new idea out that's gonna involve human subjects. We go to a investigational review board and these ethicists and the community actually review the protocol and make sure that it's acceptable. And what does it meaning acceptable mean? That we've actually done our job as engineers to mitigate the risks to the patient and that the protocol itself has a valid scientific question. So once we've established that, that can get us through the first stage of a clinical trial and show the feasibility. Then ultimately we have to get regulatory approval and that'll be a much larger clinical trial that really justifies 
that the system does what we says it, say that it will, it performs the actions that we say it will do, and that it basically we understand the risks and that those can be communicated or contained by a clinician. The longer term area, so in the space where I operate, I tend to work on disease states. Um, so Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, dystonia, epilepsy, and a lot of times there's a very compelling reason why we want to actually try to serve uh, and create therapies that address those disorders. When you get into augmentation, which is a area of research interest, so like how do we make you smarter than you are, or how do we create new functionality, that starts to push into a new domain where the ethicists are still trying to sort that out. And what I'd ask you is some questions, so the things I'd ask you students to think about, because you will actually have to head into these issues head on over your lifetimes because the technology is becoming available. So how much risk are you willing to take? Um, and should we be willing to let people take? You can look online and they actually have these transcranial stimulators that you can hook up to yourself. And one of the areas that's of concern for regulators is that people are at home hacking, kind of doing a biohack and trying to make themselves smarter. My personal view is that if people are going to do it, I would actually first focus on educating them on how to do it smart, you know, understand the risks of what you're setting yourself up for. Other concerns as a society I think that we need to think about is that there's already a spread, say, in income and uh, other social factors what are we going to do if the only access to these um, augmentation strategies go to the well-to-do? Does that just actually stress the societal challenges that we already face? Um, so these are the kind of questions that I think you really need to think carefully about. We're already thinking about them, but they're gonna become more and more of an issue as you grow older, and especially as the technology becomes more available. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, very good question. So the, the area of risk management is absolutely central to medical device design. And so what you're talking about is risk management. And so the notion there is to identify the risks and um, do the best you can to mitigate them. So we'll use your example of Bluetooth. Um, we'd say, well, what could cause a Bluetooth channel to go awry? One thing would be if there's just too many channels that are available to you, too many channels around that actually jam the signal or some other interfere. So in, in my own experience um, working on medical devices, we were thinking about what's the right radio to put into a device. And so actually what's shown there is, is not actually Bluetooth. So what's, what's used in the cardiac pacemaker um, that I was showing is a combination of either a magnetic coupling system, which is only works very close to the patient within a few centimeters, or a special band called the MIX band, M-I-C-S, the Medical Information and Communication Services band. And so it's been set aside across the globe as a special band for just medical implants to use and to communicate over. And there are 10 bands that are set aside in a very specific protocol that has to be used. That's kind of interesting as trivia, when they were trying to identify a free band, there weren't that many. And so it's actually shared with weather balloons. And so in the concept of your question, you think, well, what's the risk? Now the residual risk is that I'm a pacemaker patient in the programming unit and a weather balloon happens to fall on me. Well, We've dealt with that because we have 10 channels and we can actually try to sidestep around that. So your question is actually incredibly important when, it think, when you think about these device designs, to think about the things that can go wrong and what are the steps that you have to take to try to prevent them. Ultimately, they're try, they're, in terms of radios, there's, we try to have some redundant path, a way to communicate with the device. 
And then there are also fail-safe options that try to go to a safe programming state or safe operating state so that the patient isn't put in any danger. Um, off the back there. I'm just going back to the start of the talk or lecture, when you were talking about the cosmic waves and that, I wanted to know if you'd actually gotten close to finding or pinpointing where they, the origin of those waves are. Oh, yeah, so the, uh, so the, the long-term outcome is to point to a, uh, a few galaxies. What I'll do is I'll, I'll post a little follow-up that you can tweet out about some of the, some of the observations that were made. W one of the most interesting um, findings from the detector is that um, some of the predictions made by old physicists from you know, 100 years ago actually ended up being confirmed in terms of the dynamics of the particles coming down and how they propagate. And that was one of the earliest uh, observations that was made while I was still there. And then for the next 20 years, they continued to do follow-up observations. Um, over that side. Uh, how long do the implants last, and do they have to be on medication to stop the body from uh, actually uh, trying to break down the implants? Okay, great questions. The, um, keep them coming. These are very, very good. So the, uh, it's, it's a great question about design. And so the, there are pros and cons for um, many different design choices. Um, how many of you have a cell phone? or smartphone kind of system, or someone in your family has one. Okay, what do you do probably every night? It's not, I don't ask trick questions to students. You recharge it. So the, in the medical device space over the last five years, we've started to look at rechargeable systems. Can you imagine if you had a phone that never recharged, one would be this big, you could probably make one phone call a week, and it would still only last a couple years. And so that's the trade-off. Now, the trick is with the recharge, with the batteries, those will last on the order of 10 to 15 years, okay? So these are, what you're gonna notice, I'm gonna tend to ask you questions back, and it's because there are really not being an engineering problem. There are no absolutes. These are just the things you have to think about. I'm kind of going to walk you through my thought process. So, you have a device that will last 15 years. Think about the technology. I got the age roughly here. So that's about when many of you were born, or a few years, a few years, you were a couple years old. What was the technology like 15 years ago? Pretty antiquated, They're pretty, pretty antiquated. So one of the trade-offs we have is that you learn a lot about the human body and the way to provide clinical care over 15 years. And so one of the things we have to design into these recharges is the rechargeable system is the ability to upgrade them in some way so that if we learn a better way to provide therapy, we can actually um, try to make that available to the patient who has a system. Now let's take a walk in the, in the shoes of a patient. I always think this is very important for you to understand what they're going through. What's a potential downside of having a rechargeable medical device? Do you have a question to answer to my question? Yeah. Yeah, or you forget to recharge it. Exactly, I'm saying you don't have the time to recharge it or you forget. That can be a real problem especially if it's a life-sustaining device. If it's keeping you alive, you really don't want to let the device discharge. And so what you'll find is that the rechargeable systems tend to be in areas where they're not life-sustaining. They're basically improving your quality of life. So for instance, in this example with the tremor gentleman, he'll have trouble with his tremors, but it's not necessarily keeping him alive. A cardiac pacemaker might be life-sustaining. And so what you see is that medical devices will have rechargeable systems, which might last for 10 to 15 years in these areas that are not life-sustaining. But in the areas where they are life-sustaining, they tend to be primary cell, which means non-rechargeable. And so those tend to last 
on the order of five to eight years, like that little device that goes inside of the heart that I was showing um, lasts about that order. The trick is by being primary cell, you can't do as much functionality, you can't deliver as much energy, and you can't quite do as much communication. So everything has constraints associated with it. Up the back there. Um, do you believe that in the near future we could accurate, like more accurately read exactly what the brain's doing? So at the moment we can read that the brain's wanting to move, but do you reckon we would be able to read how it wants to move specifically so that we could um, use that with prosthetics? Yeah, absolutely. So just to make sure everyone heard, so doing more than just detecting um, when you want to move in general and getting more specific. So I'd like to take three volunteers. So you who asked the question, please come down. And then uh, we'll take, yes, second row there. Actually, the two of you, first and second row, come on up. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take four. I, <laughs> okay, we're gonna stand in a quadrant. So you face the screen. So name, please. Miley. Thank you, Miley. Come on up. And your name is? Sydney. Sydney, come on over, Sydney. Your name is? Reagan. Reagan, come over here. Now you're gonna face this direction. And you're gonna face this direction. And your name is? Spencer. Thank you, Spencer, you're gonna face this direction. Okay, so what we were measuring in the system I demonstrated was just their activity. So when you're active, you kind of go up and down like this. So practice up, up and down, yeah, don't be embarrassed. We're all gonna be embarrassed together. Okay, now, part of the biggest trade-offs we have as engineers is kind of the scale of the nervous system that we talk to. And so what I showed you is a very broad measurement that just says, the four of them are kind of active, so there's something going on with motion. And that's kind of the reason we choose to do that is because those right now are the most reliable electrodes. However, there are a lot of researchers who are actually getting one step deeper. They're going in with finer grain electrodes and they're measuring the activities of individual neurons. And so what will happen is, if we want to move in this direction, this cell will be very active. These two middle cells, only raise your arm half as much, will be a little active, yep, keep yours up, but not quite as active, no activity here. And so then, okay, arm down, arms all down. Now, if you're thinking about moving in this direction, take a guess. All up, and you too. Good, very good, and your arm, all the way down. No activity there. And this is called vector processing. So this, the actual cells in your body are tuned to a specific direction. And then what we do is we put an electrode here, 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 and here, and actually all across. It's as though all of you are on the stage. We actually listen to 100 cells. And we say, on average, which direction are we pointing? And then the Patients can actually control cursors and other things. Let's thank our volunteers. I don't want to scare you. I won't bring everyone down for a demo if you ask a question. But I think it's really important that there are these different scales to the nervous system, and you can start to decode them in different ways and get more and more um, sophisticated. And so in t to get to the final answer to the question, there are actual teams that are now hooking up brain implants with that kind of coding. It's actually very s similar coding to control things like a multi-degree freedom robot arm. Amazing. I'm sure we have more questions. Um, in the middle there. Was that the same way you increased the simulation of the gentleman who was having tremors? It's very similar. Um, but what I was was one level up with the Florida team in the abstraction. And so what we were doing is we were basically asking ourselves, are any of the cells at any given time kind of raising their arm, or are they all down quiet? Now, it's interesting, though, is that it's not just a spiking behavior. The reason I was having everyone go up and down is that there are these rhythms in your brain. And so if I, if I hooked up electrodes to your brain and put them through an amplifier and looked on an oscilloscope, 
as you close your eyes and relax, you actually can see these rhythms, these oscillations coming and going, and they go on the order of, say, 10 hertz. Now, what's fascinating, I think, for you, at least for me, is that the person who discovered these was convinced that we had ESP. So kind of the story of the, uh, the inventor. What happened was he fell off a horse and his sister, who was 100 miles away, had this premonition that something bad had happened to him. And so he said, I'm going to go figure out where does this, uh, where does this uh, signal come from. And so he invented the technique of the EEG. Now, when he was doing these measurements, he called on his daughter to help out. And he, he would hook up her, hook up the electrodes to her head and look at the measurement. And uh, guess what signal he found? It's the one that's associated with boredom and calmness. And so this, that's kind of this dominant 10 hertz rhythm that you'll have. And so what we do is we're listening in at kind of the rhythms in the brain, kind of that overall activity. And as that oscillation comes and goes, we can detect that and use that to turn the stimulator on and off. So it's tapping into different signals and different ways of communicating within those cellular ensembles. More questions? Questions over here. Um, two questions. Um, are the heart implants currently being used like in hospitals? And also, what happens if the device like malfunctions? Like, can you take it out easily, or is there a really complicated process with that? And did I hear the heart implants used today in hospitals? Yes, uh, yeah, are they used today? Um, oh, yeah. Okay, yes. So the um, the cardiac pacemaker um, that I was showing, there's several hundred thousand of those implanted every year, approaching actually close to a million worldwide. Um, it's a very standard of care. We, in, in, I'm trying to remember not to fall into uh, lingo. So when I say standard of care, if one of you faints and you'll be in, brought to the hospital and measured, and if you actually are seen to have a slow heartbeat, almost certainly you'd have a pacemaker, a cardiac pacemaker put in. It's very standard. Uh, the, uh, the, the newer one. Oh, the neural one. So thank you. Okay, so the, the neural one is much more... Um, much more early in its life stage. And so for the tremors and the Parkinson's disease, on the order of about 20,000 of those go in worldwide every year. So they're approaching about 200,000 patients cumulatively who have had one of those devices. So it's in a much uh, earlier stage. And you can imagine one of the concerns to the application of this technology is of course putting electrodes in the brain. So that's definitely a um, concern for the patients and something that has to be worked out to make sure that they're feeling comfortable with it. In terms of um, things going wrong, the, one of the most common things uh, would be like a lead breakage. And so there, there's the leads being routed and so you have to worry about the wire breaking. And so one of the ways to try to mitigate that would be choosing the appropriate materials so we actually look at the materials that are used, the way that they're coiled, so they might actually be wired and with a little bit of a springiness to them, so that as you kind of go back and forth, um, it'll bend with the body. And then there's also a lot of testing, so they're actually robots that sit there and kind of continuously bend over and over again to validate the materials and the forces that they see will be robust. In the worst case scenario, um, in most of these devices, you can, um, if there's a break, you, first thing you would try is a, a nearby electrode. There's some redundancy um, in, within the electrodes. See if you could use one of those. In worst case scenario, you'd have to replace that, uh, replace that lead. Um, down there, second row. Um, what kind of diseases and disorders are you looking into now, and how are you going to fix them? So the You'll oftentimes hear me say royal we, um, because it's definitely partnerships with clinicians and neuroscientists and the like. So one of the big areas that's evolving right now is the area of epilepsy, um, where you might be familiar, you'll have um, these episodic seizures. So in many cases, out of nowhere, a seizure will propagate and incapacitate someone 
In some cases, you might have an aura as a warning sign, but looking at electricity and how it might be able to go in and intervene and either prevent or certainly suppress the impact of seizures is a very interesting area. Another area of um, research that's being explored is in the area of depression, where people have chronic depression and looking at the mood circuits. Um, that is a very, very challenging area for a number of reasons. Um, one is we have to think about the neuroethics of interventions um, for neuropsychiatry. Another consideration is it can be difficult to measure the impact. So you see when the tremor, and part of the reason I like to show that as an example, is you can all see with your eyes the impact that the stimulation is having. In the case of um, neuropsych, it's a little harder to have an objective measure of how well the device is doing. And in terms of the targets that are used, the actual locations, the electrode, and the appropriate area of stimulation, that's a very, very active area of research and still being sorted through. Okay, up the back there. Kind of tied back to that question about my office orientation, but do you see these neurological kinds of being able to be used in more commercial or industrial means in the future, in the future or as some sort of aid for workers in certain fields? I, a little bit louder, I can just barely hear you, sorry. Um, this ties back to the question about bionics and augmentation, but do you see these neurological implants in the future, whether they will be able to be used for more commercial or industrial purposes for mm -hmm. certain fields? Yeah, I, I think the, um, if we, I mean, and I'm going to do kind of an answer to your question, and then I'll actually directly go to your question. The, because the first step I want to make clear is not all the implants are being used within the brain. There are other areas of the nervous system where they're being applied as well. Um, one area would be spinal cord stimulation that's applied for chronic pain. The uh, other area is sacral nerve stimulation or tibial nerve stimulation for incontinence. And so these are areas that basically tapping to other networks of the body and, and trying to provide some level of relief. In the future, um, in the far off future, I can definitely see this branching into other areas of communication um, and how we communicate with each other um, as an extension of measuring some of our biological functions and a lot of our, a lot of um, the and of social media companies and the like are starting to take an active interest in this. But one of the key elements is in the first stage is they're trying to actually do some of this measurement and readout without, um, without providing a, um, a, without requiring an invasive implant and instead just using external sensors to try to provide some level of readout. Okay, we'll go there, second row. How big would the implants like actually be? Would they be like really small? Or they be yeah, so the, the size of the implant um, varies from kind of a few seats, and CCs don't really describe it well. So devices on the order of this size down into devices that are basically like the tip of my pinky. And so, and, and areas in between. And especially that's the current generation. And of course, there's a strong motivation to shrink those down even farther. Um, that? How much risk was um, there to provide with the neurological implant for the uh, man with the tremor? How much risk was involved in trying to make sure that the right amount of stimulation was given to minimize the tremor? that was occurring within the brain. So in terms of the risk, one of the, one of the things to think about is where, where the therapy came from. And so in the case of the tremor subject and some of the Parkinson's, historically what was done was a, a neurosurgeon would actually go in with a RF probe and say lesion the circuit, so actually cut that circuit in the brain for people who are really suffering from these disorders. And so the, one of the pioneers in the field, um, Professor Benabid in Grenoble, what he did was go in and before providing a lesion, actually turned on the stimulator and said, what's the impact if I just stimulate the circuit? And actually saw very similar symptom relief. 
And so the, um, that was the insight, kind of the eureka moment that led, kind of kicked off the space of doing a, a biological intervention. Now in terms of the, the, the risks they, that a surgeon worries about, so what they will do is actually image, they call it the surgical planning, they will image a patient's brain, look at with an MRI, plan a trajectory to get the lead into an area of a specific target, trying to avoid any blood vessels um, and try to certainly steer clear of those to avoid any kind of uh, hemorrhage. And then once the lead is placed, part of the job of the engineers is to give the degrees of freedom so a neurologist can actually adjust which electrode and how much current is provided and what frequency. And then they can adjust those through the wireless radio and try to titrate the appropriate uh, stimulation for that patient. Um, at the back there. Um, so with the neurotransplant, would it be possible to reverse paralysis in the lower body? Sorry. Using the neurotransplant, would it be possible to reverse paralysis in the lower body? Yeah. So the question was paralysis in the lower body. There, there's a lot of interest in applying this technology and providing patterns of stimulation, they call it functional electrical stimulation, where they can do the um, kind of look at synchronizing stimulation to the muscles so that you can get the uh, cycles of motion back. So there's a, a group in um, Switzerland under Gregoire Cortine. He's been very active in exploring this area, as has a group in um, the United States under Susie Harkema. And so they keep adjusting different levels of spinal cord stimulation and seeing if they can actually restore ambulation in patients. One of the things that's important, um, and I would you know, have you keep in mind, is that a lot of times some of the injuries that people feel, you know, their priorities don't necessarily match what your assumptions would be. And so like in the case of spinal cord injury, you might think that um, ambulating again is high on the priority list, and it is important important for those um, patients. However, they're more interested in things such as um, incontinence generally and other issues that arise with spinal cord injury, like the maintenance of your blood pressure and the ability to sweat. And so it's very important that when you look at designing a therapy for a patient, you're actually thinking about what matters to them and not actually assuming what's the uh, most important thing to address. Um. Back there, um, If we go back to when you were studying cosmic waves, uh, do you um, did you ever see yourself changing to bioengineering, and do you think you're going to go back to studying um, space science, or are you enjoying this? So, it's, yeah, it's a good question. So the area of, did I expect to um, go from kind of particle physics into biology and would I go back into particle physics? So the, um, let's say, who knows? Um, in terms of the last question, it's probably not likely um, at this stage, maybe it'd be something I'd pursue in retirement. When I was closer to your age, so I was just a few years older than uh, you are, my, my attitude was to take a pretty broad sampling of the different areas that were available to me to study. And I, I think one of the things that's interesting when I reflect, now it's, I gotta be careful that I don't assign causation to just a correlation, but you know, my father was an engineer and my mother was a nurse. And so I kind of grew up surrounded by engineering and medical practice. And I think that did have a bearing and in the interest that I ended up having, but I certainly went into it with an open mind. One of the things that we didn't talk about was that in the interim time, I actually studied anthropology and went on archaeology digs. Um, and you might say, what? Um, but actually, when I was an executive in industry, that time studying anthropology and understanding people and cultures and how they interact was probably as important to me doing my job as certainly any of the physics that I studied. And so that's, the, that's something that I'd have you really ponder is make sure you're rounding out your education so that you can really participate within a team and know how to communicate with each other. Um, at front, start first. How much do these devices cost? And are they like available? What's that? Uh, how much do these devices cost? 
Oh, it's a big spread. Um, you know, the, the medical implants range from the, and it always depends on which healthcare system you're in and the like, but they'll go from the hundreds of dollars to the hundred to thousand dollars kind of uh, level. And so in all points in between. And so it's a good, a good question, which actually I'm going to speak to tonight, is thinking about the economics of these systems. And you, can you justify the cost for the quality of life that you're actually providing for people? And that's a key question that we actually have to face into when you design these systems. So do you have time for two more questions? I'll take one from here and over there. Okay. With, um, with the, the implants and the pacemakers and whatever, has there been much testing or research about the effects on animals and disorders in them? Yeah, interesting question. So the, um, I'm going to speak this evening about the, the epilepsy work we were talking about earlier. One of our test cases right now is um, epilepsy that naturally occurs in dogs. And so it ends up your pets tend to have epilepsy at about the same rate that we do as humans. And the epilepsies actually have a lot of similar characteristics. And so our, our first trial subjects with the next generation device is actually a, a group of pet dogs out from the University of California at Davis. So there's a strong interest um, in seeing what we can do to actually learn what are the fundamentals of diseases by looking across species. And you know, pets are an interesting area. With that said, you also have to follow all the ethics and kind of the quality checks that you would uh, put in place for humans. They're, they're different, of course, in animals, but they actually are there. And so we do, you know, animal rights and the like have to be very carefully considered in this space. Um, last question. Yes. Um, what if a patient is uh, allergic to a significant part of a medical device? Does that take it into consideration during the design process? Or? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So the um, material science is fundamental to these systems and the design of these systems. And many of the devices today um, use titanium um, as, the, as the metal that actually encapsulates the, uh, the pulse generator, what we call the can, so the can that goes in the chest. And there are a small percentage of patients that are allergic to titanium and have a reaction to it. And so one of the things that's been done historically is in those patients to get a special prescription and you can, your doctor can write a prescription for a customized device and then they'll end up coating it with another material so that you don't have an allergic response. So one example is um, they can coat it in gold and gold plate it and then that could have help to uh, alleviate the allergic reaction. But the materials and the material properties and how those interact with the body is a major, major part of the design of these devices, including thinking about how people might have an allergic reaction. Thank you so much for both those amazing questions and Professor Dennison's wonderful responses to them. Could you please join me one last time in thanking him for his presentation? Yeah, I want to thank you. Those are great questions. So. They really were. And I hope that you'll um, all take away some nuggets of gold um, and look forward to the presentation later tonight. Um, thank you so much, everyone.